Okay, my name is Andreas Friedwagner. I'm uh, working for Veracon, um, a Vienna-based consultancy which is specialized in sustainable transportation planning. Um, I'm here to guide you through this uh, webinar, uh, which is hosted by two Austrian uh, ministries. First of all, the Austrian Federal Ministry of Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation and Technology. And secondly, by the Austrian Federal Ministries of Agriculture, Regions and Tourism. The faces of these two great women that you see on the moderation panel are uh, those from Alexander Dörfler from the Austrian Ministry of Climate Action, short title, and Ingrid Zimmermann, um, her counterpart on the side of the Tourism uh, Ministry. These two are supporting me today to uh, guide you through this webinar. We have actually a great agenda. You are uh, have a look at it, I assume. Um, We'll start with an introduction of uh, Robert Tala, as soon as he's uh, joining us here on the Hoping platform. Um, his input will be followed up by a great intervention and introduction by Peter Hexton uh, from the OECD. And uh, after his input, we are um, having some good practice examples presented by experts from the cycling um, sector, from uh, railways, as well as from uh, tourism experts. Um, this will then be followed by a panel discussion and short conclusions at the very end. Um, ah, here we go. We have Robert on the panel. Yes, hello. Sorry, Welcome, Robert. Robert. Sorry, um, great to have you here. Uh, Robert Tarr is the head of the Department of Active Mobility and Mobility Management with the Austrian Federal Ministry of Climate Action and Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation and Technology. And most importantly, he's the acting chair of the PEP. And in this position, I would like to ask him to give us short words of welcome uh, to this seminar on sustainable tourism mobility. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Sorry for the delay, but uh, the preparation of the high-level meeting, uh, as you can imagine, is an uh, important task with every second some changes. Um, but I can tell you the webinars already uh, have been a very successful exercise, so we have a very good uh, feedback. And uh, also the, the forthcoming ministerial meeting on Monday, Tuesday, uh, will be a, a real essential event. We have already uh, 45 ministers uh, having confirmed to be there. So it's a real big, big issue with a uh, big conference with a lot of decisions. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, it's about the next decade. So it's a really decisive phase um, to transform our mobility system and our transport system. And the conference title itself says, uh, where the, where the points have to be set. Uh, I think uh, building forward better is the most important story we have to tell. We don't want to build things back better, as some are saying. We don't want to keep old structures. We want to use these challenges, climate neutrality and COVID-19 recovery um, to build forward better the transport system. That would mean transforming it to a system which is clean, sustainable, healthy, um, inclusive, safe, and uh, of course, accessible to everybody. And tourism is one of the most important issues here because tourism without mobility cannot exist. And tourism is a special, one of the biggest players also in mobility. We know that in Austria very well. We have a lot of good experiences in sustainable tourism. And I must congratulate everybody who has worked together in the Alpine Pearls or in the Transdanube Pearls, where we, did, where we tried to push and, and help uh, the positioning on the tourism market in an environment-friendly way, in a sustainable way, which is, I think, very important for the future. And now COVID has brought us a real big challenge because all our pillars, especially rail traffic, a public transport, use of buses is now seen with a lot of uh, reluctance 
And if you look at this, the economic situation of transport companies, it's really a horror story what, what losses on passengers they have to face because of the restrictions. And on the other hand, this will need enormous time to get back the people in the buses and in the trains because they are now in the cars because they think the car is a safe environment. I'm not being affected anymore. I will not have no infection uh, risk, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is a real trap. On the other hand, the active mobility is booming. So cycling tourism is one of the most attractive uh, modes now because there you have you are in the nature, you are outside, you have not these infection risks. So it's a very ambitious challenge we have to face. And therefore, this uh, initiative, which we started regionally on the Danube corridor and in, before that in the Alpine area, with a lot of help of member states of the EU and other uh, outreach member states and the EU money, we will uh, enlarge this. We have uh, an agreement also with our colleagues in, uh, in, the, in the Ministry of uh, Rural Affairs and Regions, where tourism is located. <clears throat> Some years ago, we have been one ministry where we have been all together and now, but we have this relationship with our colleagues that we will use this opportunity of this milestone conference in Vienna to launch a new partnership on sustainable tourism mobility. So take all on board what we have on a good experience and also try to share it with other regions and um, try to build forward better also uh, mobility in the tourism sector, but also not in the classical tourism sector, but also in, 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 in the events or in uh, long or short uh, trips, because the, all of us are interested as tourism <clears throat> will, uh, will um, restart again. Uh, and we should ensure that uh, the advantages we, and the achievements we already have achieved would not be lost with this pandemic. And therefore, I congratulate this initiative and wish you all the best. We have ensured that this initiative to start a new partnership is already in the Vienna Declaration, which will be adopted in Vienna. So the basis, the strategic basis on this decision is there. And I hope this is a good uh, platform for the next five years to come up with uh, important recommendations and good practices and cooperations on, on this level with other countries to achieve a real um, building, building forward better in tourism mobility. So all the best from my side. And uh, I have to apologize. I cannot participate all the time because I have to prepare the minister for the, for the ministerial conference. Which is, I already skipped my holiday tomorrow. I skipped my birthday on Friday. So the weekend will be full of work. But I think this uh, positive feedback um, is, it's worth, makes it worthwhile to invest here. So good luck. Uh, I hope uh, we will uh, have a nice partnership on tourism mobility where we achieve a lot of uh, new and in interesting initiatives. So, and thank you all for the good cooperation so far. And I hope this good spirit of cooperation will also be our guideline in the future. Thank you very much for these very motivating words, Robert. And um, I also share some wishes for uh, your birthday with you in the chat from Derek O'Neill from Ireland. Happy birthday, Robert. Same from, from our side. I hope you, you at least have some minutes to enjoy uh, this uh, great day. I have a private meeting with my minister to brief all the things. Oh, excellent. What else can you wish on a birthday? <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, as we don't have um, Peter Hexton on the panel yet, uh, I would suggest that we start with uh, good practices. Uh, Robert Tala already mentioned that we are not starting from scratch. There have been quite some international initiatives trying to establish sustainable mobility in tourism. Alpine pearls, then you pearls. Just the two ones uh, Robert mentioned, but we have actually a real boom in cycle tourism, especially during COVID times. This was one of the pillars within tourism um, that was uh, quite successful, especially as England tourism is concerned. Um, we are very happy that we have uh, three very uh, potent and, and great um, uh, speakers invited to give us a short introduction. Um, but they are field of activity. Uh, this is first of all Ed Lancaster. Uh, he is responsible for the European network at European Cyclist Federation. Uh, then we have Karin Fest. 
She is the head of the new rail business at Austrian Federal Railways, responsible for the NICHAT network. A good practice example, I think, from Austria, uh, exported to all over Europe, expanding to all over Europe. And we have Petra Riffer. She is the secretary general of the Danube Pearls Network and project partner of the Danube Transnational Danube Travel Stories Project. Um, furthermore, she is a tourism expert um, working in the Upper Austrian uh, Danube region. Um, so we also have Karin here, so we should bring her also on the panel. But we start with Ed and your presentation, please. Thanks very much, Andreas. Let me just share my screen. If that doesn't work, Ed, I can support you with that if you want. I think I think got it here. Coming now, you can see. Not yet. Yes. Yeah, I put it into full. Now. Excellent. Great. Okay. What's yours, Ed? Thanks very much, Andreas. So yes, I'm going to be talking about uh, the Eurovelo network, which is uh, the European Cycle Route network. This is the, uh, the outline of the presentation. I'd like to cover the next 10 minutes. So I'll briefly introduce uh, my organization, the European Cyclist Federation, but then talk about Eurovelo, the European Cycle Route Network. Talk more broadly about the benefits of cycle tourism. We've heard from Robert and Andreas already about how uh, the numbers of cycle tourists have been growing in recent, in recent years. So we can talk about the benefits of that. Then I also wanted to highlight how you realize those benefits. So maybe just give some advice and pointers on, on what needs to be done to try and get get part of the part of the action so to speak and then I have some some closing words so just a few slides about ECF uh, apologies if you've seen slides from my colleagues there have been a few of them giving presentations over the last couple of days the so European Cyclist Federation was established in 80 back in 1983 with a federation of civil society organizations uh, with 60 over 60 members in over 40 different countries promoting cycling as a sustainable and healthy means of transportation and leisure and we're, we're hoping to harness this power, the growing power of European cycle movements on the European level. We see the, the advantage of that of the various uh, positive societal impacts of cycling. So this includes things like clean air, fewer road deaths and serious injuries, healthier, happier citizens, more livable cities and towns, better rural connectivity, greener leisure and tourism options, more vibrant local economies, and more inclusive societies. We've, we've tried to put some, some numbers next to these, these benefits, trying to quantify the benefits of cycling. So these are the annual economic benefits of cycling in Europe under CO2 emissions, six, 16 million tonnes of savings uh, per year. Over to the left-hand side here, we can see reduced sickness abstinence, 5 billion euro saving, 73 billion euro saving from longer and healthier lives, 7 billion euros. And cycle tourism, which of course is the focus of today's presentation, uh, 44 billion euros. So giving a total of 150 billion euros benefits to the European economy. But as I say, the, the focus for my presentation today is cycle tourism, in particular the work we do on Eurovelo. So European Cycle, cycle Route Network, for those that aren't familiar with it, is this network of 17 long distance routes that cross and connect the whole continent. It goes through 42 different countries. And the ECF coordinates this network on the European level with a network of national Eurovelo coordination centers and coordinators. When complete, it will total over 90,000 kilometers and will generate 7 billion euros in direct and annual revenue. Uh, we've done some figures recently last year in terms of the current status of the network. It's about 60% developed, so about 51,000 kilometers are developed already, 36% of which have the Eurovelo dedicated Eurovelo signing up already. Wherever possible, we're using existing national networks. So we're not trying to create something for the sake of it. We're trying to connect existing net networks where they exist. And of course, in some countries, they don't have national or regional networks yet. So there we can work as sort of a, a flagship initiative to develop cycle routes. I'm sure some of you look at this map and think, I mean, who, who cycles from the Arctic Circle all the way down to Malta? Well, the answer is not that many. Some of our, our longest routes are over 10,000 kilometers. So you need quite a lot of time to do that. Uh, far more common is, of course, that people will cycle small sections of this 
And of course, if you break it down, these routes go through towns and cities and communities. So it's, it's not just a tourism tool. I should, should stress that. It's for day-to-day -day mobility as well. And it plays an important role as a backbone to national and regional cycle networks, which are, of course, a lot more denser. So as you can see in this, this diagram here, Eurovela networks are on the European level. These are European level routes, but then they have national and regional local networks below that that all connect together uh, in, a, in a broad. Cycle tourism, as, as we've heard already, is, has been growing already pre-2020 increasing there's a number of reasons for that we've seen the development of things like e-bikes that's made it a lot more attractive for a wider variety of people we now see family groups going out on there a lot of people are interested in active tourism so taking part in amateur events and and trials and and uh long uh, giving them test, testing themselves doing charity bike rides and things most city centers in europe now will have some kind of cycle hire system where you do you can do a city center tour so there's a whole variety now of different cycle tourism options out there. And you can now see that it's making a significant, taking a significant share of the overall uh, tourism market. This is the figures from, from Germany showing 5.4 million cycling holidays, which compares similar to sea and river cruises, caravan trips, coach trips there. So you can see it's a, it's a growing market. And last year really acted as an accelerator uh, to a lot of these trends. So th these, this is data from the Eurovela routes in France. Uh, the green line shows the number of visitors on the Eurovela routes in France in 2019. The blue line shows the number of visitors in 2020. Of course, France had quite a, a strict lockdown uh, during the springtime last year. But you can see as soon as the restrictions were loosened up, you can see the numbers were much higher than on the previous year. So that was a pattern we've seen across Europe last year that more and more people were seeing cycle tourism as a health, healthy and safe way of uh, getting out and exploring there. Uh, some quite often local areas that, that was another big trend from last year was people weren't necessarily traveling overseas, so they're exploring their, their own country domestic tourism. So why invest in cycle tourism more generally? Well, it's active. It's a healthy way of uh, doing tourism. There are not many types of tourism where you come back potentially fitter than when you left. Uh, it's a very sustainable form of tourism. It boosts local economies and supports small and medium sized enterprises. A lot of the industries involved in cycle tourism are, are these SMEs. It improves infrastructure for local journeys and rural connectivity. Of course, if planned in the right way, cycling infrastructure can be used by local communities as well as by um, cycle tourists themselves. It attracts tourism to new areas and can ease issues of over tourism that we've seen in popular hotspots in recent years. I'm sure you're all familiar with the, the news related to that. And there are options for all ages and abilities. And as I say, developments such as the e-bike, we saw something like 30% of uh, trips, tour, cycle tourism trips last year in Germany were by e-bike. That really means you can have a mixed group. It doesn't necessarily all have to be the same level of fitness now to take part in cycle uh, tourism trips. And we think it's got a lot more potential to grow um, with, with investment and with support from the relevant authorities, which leads me uh, to some of the economic benefits of psychotourism. So the European Parliament commissioned a study several years ago now trying to estimate the economic impact of, of uh, tourism, psychotourism. It came up with a figure of 44 billion euros, which compares similar to the European cruise ship industry. And it employs a significant number of people, over half a million jobs across the EU region. So how to realize these benefits? I think hopefully you, you, there's a lot of awareness about the benefits of investing in cycle tourism, but how, what do you need to invest in? Well, to get those cycle tourists, uh, this the, perhaps the most obvious thing is the route infrastructure itself. So having cycle routes for them to, to cycle on, but there's also services, so dedicated services, marketing and promotion. You can have the best cycle routes in the world, but if you're not promoting it, people aren't gonna know about it and come and experience it. Monitoring, of course, is always important, not just in cycle tourism, that goes for all areas. Um, but then also organization, something that's often left behind is because of this two different things that need to be invested in, uh, it needs a cross-sectorial approach needs to be taken. So organization is important too. Just to highlight, I've got a couple of slides to highlight what you could potentially be doing as national authorities if you work on the national level. So route infrastructure I've talked about. So it's establishing and maintaining coherent and connected cycle route networks on the national level, the regional level and the local levels. For services, so supporting the development of cycle friendly services. 
So these are hotels, restaurants, potentially that have particular services, somewhere you can safely lock up your bike at night in a hotel. Also, I'm very pleased to see that I'm, I'm followed the, the next speakers from the Austrian Railways, though they do a very good job at uh, encouraging the combining of bikes and trains. This helps, again, with the sustainable forms of uh, tourism. Uh, marketing promotion for both as a national destinations, but also regional destinations or specific routes. Monitoring is always important in terms of the users, knowing who is coming on your route so you can tailor your services for them, but also monitoring the infrastructure, making sure it's up to date and being maintained. And then, as I say, this importance of having organizations, so establishing coordination centers to oversee uh, and make sure that all the different sectors, the public, private, NGOs, cycling users are all involved in developing successful cycle tourism destinations. I'm pleased to see that many of these recommendations have made it into the PEP master plan for cycling promotion, which will be adopted next week. And uh, there's a particular chapter on cycle tourism, chapter nine, but also some of the other rec recommendations elsewhere in the document uh, relate to cycle tourism. I've listed the overview there. And for, I know not all the people listening here will necessarily be from EU countries, but for those that are, just to highlight that this is a good moment. We're at the beginning of a new financial period, so it's a good opportunity to try and include cycling tourism measures in uh, the priority list for EU funding for the next seven years. Some countries have yet to finalise their recovery and resilience plans. Those can include cycling measures, uh, but also the operational programmes for the coming seven-year period, they can also include measures such as those we've talked about in terms of infrastructure, cycle-friendly services and marketing and promotion. So the numbers are up. It's a very sustainable and healthy way of uh, providing tourism in Europe, um, but it needs investment and support. So we need you to help us to take it up to the next level and get even more people on their bikes going forward. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for sharing uh, this information with us, Ed. Um, I think a great overview and, and also a call for action uh, for the national level. So it's not just about destinations to invest in infrastructure, but there are a lot of tasks that need to be coordinated or um, yeah, supported from the national level. Um, you mentioned uh, one issue that we as Austrians are a bit proud of, uh, that we have a railway company that didn't um, think uh, night trains are a model not to be supported anymore, uh, but that is very much investing in this new model. And this is also necessary for Eurovelo networks and make more people travel to their starting points of their cycle tours uh, in a sustainable way. And we are very happy to have Karen Fest here. Uh, she's the head of the new uh, rail business department at Austrian Federal Railways. Karin, we are looking forward to your slides. Thank you very much, Andreas. Um, I apologize that I came so late to the meeting. I'm sorry I had uh, some internet issues, but I hope now it works. I tried to share Excellent. my presentation. Um, or what, uh, Andreas, can you share the presentation? Maybe? Yes, sir. Right. It to you. I think it's trying to support you with that. Okay, here you go. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm happy to be here today as UBBIS representative. And um, as you can see, um, I'm going to talk about uh, our night chat, which today stands as a synonym for night trains in Europe. Um, which is great, and I'm very, very confident at, that it will stay uh, that way also for the following years and um, decades, hopefully. Why is this so? Um, we are convinced um, um, that, it, that one of the main factors is that it is really a boost for um, climate neutrality um, because it is the alternative to um, short and medium haul flights. And to give you some numbers that you can see here, I also want to talk a bit about of, uh, of our history, because in 2016, it wasn't that kind of a success story that it is nowadays. By then, uh, we took over the um, Deutsche Bahn's uh, night train business, so the lines and also the rolling stock from then. And many, many experts doubted this management's decision. Today, although we see it was the right way to do so, um, the numbers show it. We um, arrive at 25 European cities overnight until now, and it is going to be more. 
And in 2019, we had about 1.5 million passengers, um, which is also great. And 80% of them would uh, recommend traveling again uh, by a night jet. And I have to say here that Nightjet is not only the brand, it is also a brand that stands for a certain quality and service level. Um, also very important, um, I think, especially regarding sustainable tourism um, and um, night rain, is that uh, climate change and sustainability is one of the top travel reasons for customers why they choose to go by train. I think we can go further. Thanks. So we have future plans, but speaking about the future in connection with night trains, it is more a bit uh, like going back to the future. Um, if you go on one slide. Yeah, what we can see here, this is back to the future. Um, it's a map from the 1990s. It shows the, um, the Trans-Zero night, uh, night train network, and you can see that Nearly every huge, uh, huge city in Europe was connected through, uh, through night trains. And that is uh, where we want to come back to. Um, we want to expand the night train network. And um, yeah, let's hope uh, with joint forces with our partners, we will uh, arrive at this point again. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, I think there is one other slide. Maybe you go uh, one more. I think we, we jumped over one. Okay, so it's fine. No, sorry, the 2024. Yeah, thanks. Okay, perfect. Um, what you can see here is um, the uh, night chat uh, network from 2024. Currently, we have 19 night chat lines um, um, into 19 destinations um, and uh, several other Euronight uh, lines where we cooperate with partners. Um, in this month, uh, by the end of this month, we will introduce a new line um, to Amsterdam. Last year, we introduced Brussels. Um, this year, we plan also to introduce Paris. Um, and until 2024, um, maybe a train will also go from Zurich to Barcelona. So um, as you can see, there are huge plans that we are working on. And um, yeah, it's getting on. Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, talking about uh, sustainable tourism, I think it goes hand in hand also with uh, European Union's Green Deal. And um, we ask ourselves also um, and are confronted with the question, what does uh, the night train business have to do with it or what can we, um, how can we support the Green Deal? In fact, 30% of the, of the EU's CO2 emissions uh, derive from the transport sector. And um, the main reasons for that, in our um, opinion, or also the facts and figures show that, is short haul flights and also, of course, the public transportation needs like cars, private cars, and so on. And therefore, we want to establish the night trains really as the travel alternative. Uh, what we need, next slide, please, is. Um, it is great, of course, that uh, night trains are so much in media right now. Even the French president um, talks about it and about a renaissance of, uh, of night trains. Um, France is even investing in uh, refurbishing their rolling stock for um, national uh, new night train lines. Um, we are also cooperating, of course. Um, there are also supporters from the European Parliament, um, like Karima Deli, the chairwoman for transport, who is supporting the night train business and so on. But what we really need are concrete actions. We need um, not only the PR messages, but concrete actions like a level playing field. And if you go one slide further, yeah. Um, what does it mean to create one uh, level playing field? This means to create transparency in costs of all modes of transport. Um, for example, um, producing a nitrogen is, is really not only uh, regarding technical challenges, uh, very um, difficult, it is also very cost intensive because, for example, you can sell uh, one seat of, uh, in an airplane like five times a day but a seat in a night train, you can sell only once a night. <laughs> so um, it is difficult. And we also need um, cost transparency in this regard. 
that, um, for example, um, there is no kerosene tax yet, but we pay um, track access charges that are extremely high. Um, or for um, there is no um, for long distance buses um, 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 any toll system or something like this. So there should be um, equal um, equal conditions for every means of transport that we're, what we are asking for. And of course, what we have to do as, as agency as well we're undertaking, we have to invest in new routes and also in new rolling stock. And for investing into this new rolling stock, we use a greenfield approach, so to say. Um, this does mean that we are working very closely together with our customers and our customer needs. And therefore also um, what you said before, Ed, um, um, that for example, the demand for taking uh, bicycles with you is a real demand that we try to implement into our new rolling stock. And I'm going to um, um, show you now a few slides, next slide please, um, of our next night chain generation. Um, even today, you can take with you bikes already in the train, in night trains, but with this new um, generation of trains that will be introduced by uh, the end of next year, the first trains will come from Siemens Mobility, and we really have more space for bikes as well. And here you can see, for example, mini suites or mini capsules that you might, might know from Asian capsule hotels uh, where you have privacy, and this is more for price sensible customers or similar customers as well that can travel safely, especially now with COVID, this is a real issue yeah, where you have your private space, which um, is a good, good thing. On the next slide, you see um, a family compartment, very cozy in a couch um, yeah, ambiente. Um, on the next slide, Yeah, thank you. You see our offer for business travelers with a bed and a working space so you can use the time. We also have shower facilities, of course, on board. We have Wi-Fi on board um, and so on. So um, that's what we are investing in. And before I end the presentation, I want to show you also that we do not stop where the railway stops, but we go further as a um, as a um, railway undertaking. Because um, we think um, mobility as a whole, we create mobility hubs um, where we offer um, a whole integrated uh, mobility service system, especially for touristic hubs. And if you go one um, slide further, yeah, um, I can show you what we do offer. For example, we have um, on every, every bigger train station, we offer a car sharing or a car pooling um, station. Um, in certain touristic hotspots, we offer bike services in Tirol. Now we have a new special offer um, for e-bikes. Um, so you can go on holidays and um, book there. Also your e-bike can go around with it in the Alps, which is I think, really a great offer. Um, a shuttle bus that brings you in winter destinations, winter destinations direct to the hotel from the train. Um, and we also have a mobility as a service platform where all those services are integrated and you can book it through one um, ticket um, the whole um, journey. Yeah, and with this, I want to end and um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karin for these great insights, what you were planning. Um, great plans, extending the network, uh, but not just uh, in your original field of uh, expertise, but also thinking about how to get the stations, how to move around. So this is uh, what we always have to have in mind when talking about sustainable mobility solutions in tourism, not just getting there, but also getting around and thinking about last and first mile solutions. Thank you very much. Um, with that, we're jumping to Petra Riffert. Um, I've been working with Petra now for a couple of years in the Danube region. Um, and still, I'm curious to get her picture uh, of sustainable mobility in the Danube region and her conclusions also from being a, a Secretary General of the Danube Pearls Network. Thank you very much, Andreas. So we will start with the next slide. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of this webinar. 
As Andreas mentioned before, my name is Petra Riffert and I am the Managing Director of the Upper Austrian Danube region since uh, 1991 now. And that's why we work uh, very significantly in, the, in tourism product development. Uh, in 1991, the infrastructure of the Danube cycle path was established and it was our um, yeah, task to, to work with this infrastructure and to work on um, yeah, products for cycling along the Danube. This was our first challenge. And the second one, the second product we um, yeah, established was the Danube hiking trail. It is called the Donaustieg. And uh, in the last few years, we worked on land excursions for the cruises on the Danube. And so these are the three main products in the Danube region in Upper Austria. These are the key elements we work on, and these are all our uh, touristic offers. The next slide, please. Uh, what does it mean to work for the tourism destination? So how is our organization composed? As I told before, since 1991, um, we uh, have an advertising association, which is called Danube Upper Austria. And in this association, the municipalities uh, along the Danube are members. These are 55 municipalities and they work, work together in order to establish a touristic infrastructure. And since 1997, uh, we also est established a company with limited liability. It is called the VGD Danube Upper Austria Tourism. And this company is, um, on the one side, it is responsible for the touristic infrastructure, like hiking or biking infrastructure. But on the other hand, it is also um, the company who operates also in the field of renting contours on the Danube for the cruises, for the cruise companies. And there is a third organization, uh, which we established in 2019. This is the Tourism Board. Um, this organization is a cooperation under public law and um, it is responsible for product development and marketing and in this company all the, um, the companies who benefit from the tourism sector are member in this tourism board and these are about 4200 companies who are part of this tourism board and um, all of these three organizations work together in a very close way. And, and my our task is to manage all the three organizations. So what are the products? Um, the products, as I mentioned before, are the Danube Cycle Pass and the Danube Hiking Trail. And um, for us, it's um, always the biggest um, task or the biggest subject to work on if we start thinking of a new tourism product or if we start thinking of new uh, infrastructure, touristic infrastructure, we first of all find out and fix the junctions to the public transport. That's re really necessary in order to develop um, mobility packages, tourism packages, where the tourists are a hefty opportunity to arrive uh, by public transport, to, um, to use public transport within the tent destination and also uh, yeah, leave the destination by public transport. And um, if, if, if we consider the Danube cycle bus, um, I think one of, of the of the, of the success of the cycle pass is that we worked uh, together with tour operators on such a cycle offers where all these um, tasks were considered. For example, um, we offer uh, cycle packages 
where the tourists uh, start their cycle trail in Passa. So they arrive in Passa by train. Then they get their bikes in Passa from bike rentals. Then they do their seven day trip on the cycle bus until Vienna. And all the luggage is transferred from one hotel to the other. In Vienna, they give back their bike and go back or return to Passau by train. And that is a, a very sustainable uh, tourism offer and round about 70,000 cyclists every year um, uh, do the cycle bus in this way. But uh, we already have a look in the future and we work on, uh, an up, on other cycle uh, infrastructure in the Danube region. Um, in 2022, um, we, will, we will have established another 15 loops for e-bike um, cyclers. Um, the loops start on the cycle uh, pass on the Danube and they reach um, to the region and they have about 60 kilometers, so they are day trips. And uh, these loops are necessary for the guests who want to stay longer in our region so that they have loops in the region. And we will establish also uh, 15 e-bike rentals in the region. So I think uh, that this is a very good um, uh, yeah, uh, development in the region that we have more offers for cyclists on the Danube. And for the hiking trail, the Donaustag, uh, we also uh, have some packages where uh, the tourists can walk or hike from Passau until Linz, for example, in seven days. They also get their luggage transferred and they can also arrive in Passau by train, then hike to Linz and also return to Passau by train or by ship again. And we also have two day trips uh, with the hiking offers where uh, the guests also can return after the two-day hiking trip by bus, ship or train to, to, the, to the starting point. And these are products uh, which are booked uh, very often by the tourists. Next slide, please. Um, and why do we consider the soft mobility in tourism? There are five reasons or trends um, which we think that, that are very, really necessary in tourism development. The first one is, as we all know, um, nature is the most important resource for a tourism destination. And we, it's our task to preserve it. It's a task from the tourism organization as well. And we have to develop um, mobility and tourism offers which preserve the nature. Uh, a very positive trend in our society is also that um, there is an increase in the awareness of sustainability and health. So the slogan back to nature is uh, a noticeable in the decision for the vacation. And people are really going to adapt their travel behaviors. Another trend is the ur urbanization and the change in mobility behavior. So um, fewer people uh, get driving licenses and that leads to a decline in private car ownerships in urban areas and all the people, they need car-free holiday options. That's why the night trains are so necessary for, for the tourists as well, that they come, can come to our destination. And of course, the Austrians can go on holidays to other de destinations. Uh, another trend is that um, more and more people uh, um, see that mobility is a part of the travel experience. And that's also a big uh, subject of the trans Danube pearls. And uh, that, so to say, uh, the traveling between the destination is also an experience, not only to be in a destination, uh, the traveling around is a, a, big, um, yeah, a big subject for the tourists 
and uh, they like it to be yeah on on the way to the next destination um so the conclusion is uh for me uh we we are we are all in a very big competition between the tourism destinations and therefore we have to think about the accessibility um, for the tourists because this is a, a crucial factor for the success and uh, we should not only consider uh, the way of the arrival and the departure of a destination we also have to um, have enough offer to travel within a destination and uh, first of all it is necessary that um, the tourists can reach the excursion spots or the highlights in a very easy way in a destination by public means of transport or by um, cycling or hiking to these uh, spots and yeah how important it is to raise the awareness on the next slide please the sustainable mobility in the danube region uh, this was the content of the first funding project which was established by the environment agency austria it was called trans danube and there the focus was on the development of mobility offers uh, since the second funding project, um, me and my organization, our organization, was part of this uh, project. The second one was called Trans Danube Pearls, a network for sustainable mobility along the Danube. And there the focus was on linking the mobility offers with tourism offers. And as a result of this project, we established a network of Danube pearls along the Danube. We, the vision of these Danube pearls, the next slide please, is to consider the entire Danube region as one destination where sustainable mobility is part of the travel experience. And um, next slide please, how uh, can we achieve this vision? So 11 destinations from eight countries between Ulm and the Danube Delta work together on linking the different mobility offers like uh, boat trips, hiking, cycling, public transport with cultural, natural and culinary offers. And we um, worked on travel tour suggestions. We worked on a brochure. Uh, where um, all the destinations were involved and we um, worked on the, to make it visible how you can travel from one destination to the other and we also made visible how you could um, travel within a destination. So this was um, uh, very challenging to work together uh, with 11 destinations in eight countries but it, I think it was worth it. And now we work together on uh, in the third funding project. The next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, a funding project um, which is called Trans Danube Travel Stories. And in this project, we work on establishing travel motifs, uh, the so-called narratives for tourists. Uh, in order to travel sustainably along the Danube. And um, we know that, yeah, that it is, this is re really a big task to bring together these countries in order to work on this, the, the same narratives. And the narratives are, for example, the Romans or, or the, the trading markets, the, the history on the Danube, but also the nature, the nature parks is, is one um, a subject and yes we want to establish double motifs that uh, people are interested in traveling along the Danube on their own way and uh, uh, within public uh, to include the public transportation yeah it's challenging but I think it's worth it so thank you very much for your intention and I'll give back to Andreas thank you very much Petra for sharing um, 
especially I think these uh, reasons why to consider sustainable mobility and tourism with us based on your experiences in Austria and uh, your experiences in this transnational uh, projects that you've been participating in. Um, I just see that we have a quite interesting question in the chat, uh, Ingrid, uh, regarding uh, luggage transfer. Um, thing is, uh, we are quite a bit late in time, and I would like to actually give the floor to Peter Hexton, so maybe we could try to answer these questions of Sylvain Baudin uh, in the chat. Um, and if this is not possible, we are trying to get back to this question a bit later, I would suggest. Um, but now, um, Peter Hexton, uh, with the international organization that is dealing also with this topic, uh, which I find very interesting. Um, and uh, you are trying to give us a bit more of a picture how uh, sustainable tourism and mobility can be a catalyst for regional development, which is very interesting, I think, uh, for the national level, how to bring forward regions that uh, do face problems in um, getting access to the overall regional and economic development in Europe. So, uh, Peter, the floor is yours. I will share um, your presentations with uh, the audience. Just a second. Uh, thank you very much, Andreas. Um, and apologies for, for my late arrival. I, I had issues with a firewall and that I've been struggling with. So I'm now um, hotspotting off my phone, and um, I'm hoping that the, that the signal is is clear enough. Is that okay? It's excellent. Fantastic. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it, it is a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. And I, again, I apologise for being for being late. Um, to, to be able to provide an OECD Tourism Committee perspective on uh, on the role of sustainable tourism and mobility as catalysts for regional development and also to support the multi-annual partnership on sustainable tourism mobility initiative uh, which i understand is to be launched at the pep uh, high level meeting next week and to be led by by austria uh, next slide please andre uh, it's clear that uh, the, the that the immediate and un unprecedented impacts of the covid 19 uh, pandemic on the sector has dramatically changed uh, the tourism policy context and while the road ahead is somewhat brighter today with, with positive growth prospects, notably thanks to progress uh, on vaccines, the, the pandemic has uh, impacted the livelihoods of millions of people throughout the world. The effects of the pandemic uh, on tourism have been both asymmetrical and highly localized within countries, with some destinations uh, more exposed than others. And countries that depend heavily on tourism um, have experienced the biggest GDP declines in 2020, uh, driven by a drop in international tourism arrivals last year. Uh, and we estimate that around uh, 75 to 80% uh, of a decrease uh, was, ex was experienced in OECD countries. And, and, and these same countries are likely to suffer slower recoveries. With consumer confidence dented and, and numerous travel restrictions still in place, the situation uh, in the tourism sector remains uh, precarious and uncertain with estimates ranging from two to four years uh, before international arrivals re return to pre-pandemic levels. Now, despite the significant impacts on the sector, many countries uh, are viewing the crisis as an opportunity to build towards a more resilient sector and to fast track the move to, to a greener and, and more sustainable models of tourism development. Next slide, please. Uh, the fundamental changes in tourism supply and demand uh, and the many and varied responses to them by countries uh, that have occurred over the past 12 months point to a need to, to rethink and reshape tourism policy moving forward. Uh, this should be guided by three key requirements and opportunities. Firstly, restoring confidence and, and enabling recovery. Learning from the experience of the pandemic and prioritising a sustainable development agenda in guiding future tourism. Next slide, please. It'll be critical for all destinations to establish effective and, and representative multi-level governance mechanisms. Uh, recent work by, by the Tourism Committee on Managing Tourism Development for a Sustainable and Inclusive Recovery highlights several key areas uh, for action. 
Next slide, please. Firstly, to achieve a, a greener, more sustainable tourism recovery and deliver positive tourism growth uh, for destinations, it's clear that a, a greater focus will need to be placed on the environmental and socio-cultural pillars of sustainability. The desired objective is a future where tourism success is not measured uh, in visitor numbers alone, but rather from a more holistic perspective that prioritises the, the positive impacts that tourism can provide uh, at the regional and destination level. A concerted and integrated effort by government across policy areas and levels uh, working closely with the private sector is needed. Uh, and for example, in Mexico, they're developing a, a sustainable tourism strategy for 2030 uh, with a primary objective of leveraging the crisis as an opportunity to generate what they're describing as radical change in tourism destinations. The aim is to develop a sector that is socially inclusive, economically fair and committed to nature conservation. The strategy is being developed in coordination with federal, state, municipal and other local authorities, uh, as well as the private sector and civil society. And it will seek to align with the SDGs to improve the way natural resources are managed in tourism areas. Next slide, please. In addition to rethinking tourism success, it's imperative that tourism is treated as only one component of a diverse economy. Policymakers need to ensure that uh, efforts to grow tourism are pursued within the context of wider economic development strategies and in close cooperation with industry and civil society. Horizontal and vertical policy integration to promote sustainable tourism recovery is critical. Uh, one example of this approach uh, is in Austria's very own Plan T, which aims to provide guidelines for the sustainable development of destinations and guide for political decision at all level. Next slide, please. Policymakers should also take additional steps to, to mainstream the concept of sustainability in tourism policies and industry practices uh, to better support the transition to, the, to a green, low emissions, low emissions and, and climate resilient tourism economy. Strategies and objectives uh, need to have clear linkages to the SDGs, as I said, uh, while a more comprehensive understanding of tourism value chains uh, will also help to identify opportunities for incremental improvement and, and capacity building needs of, of tourism operators and particularly SMEs. In, in Colombia, for example, the Tourism Sector Reactivation Plan will set out uh, strategic guidelines to, to integrate sustainability into destination decision-making processes, uh, encourage environmentally responsible business practices and models, and promote responsible tourist behavior towards natural heritage. And will also help to position Colombia as a more sustainable destination. Next slide, please. Finally, um, the crisis has also highlighted the shortcomings of the tourism statistics system. And we need more robust and timely tourism data that is sufficiently disaggregated uh, and comparable to understand the impacts of tourism at the destination level and to inform policy and business decision-making processes. Next slide, please. So, however, none of these actions can be successful without transport access and connectivity. Now, transport is an enabler of tourism, bringing tourists to their destination and onto various attractions, as we all know. The location, capacity, efficiency, and connectivity of transport play an important role in how a destination develops. Indeed, good accessibility is instrumental to the overall competitiveness of destinations. And the delivery of seamless transport can help destinations to grow their tourism economy by enabling visitors uh, to switch easily between different modes of transport and move around safely and efficiently. Uh, the important role of safe and seamless travel is also reflected in the development of G20 guidelines for safe and seamless travel and improved visitor experience, uh, which were developed by the OECD and endorsed by G20 ministers in October of last year. Next slide, please. Transport policies can be used to attract, manage or direct visitor flows to particular destinations and facilitate change to eco-friendly transport options. Many public transport, sorry, I should say making public transport easier to use by tourists and encouraging greater use of human powered mobility options can help to mitigate negative environmental impacts and, and manage seasonal peaks. Sustainable tourism based around walking and cycling, for instance, requires close collaboration between transport providers 
and local and regional authorities to provide the appropriate infrastructure, services, uh, including the provision of space of, for bicycles on trains and buses, uh, connectivity, uh, signage on walking and cycling routes, uh, attractions and accommodation options. Ensuring good linkages in the form of information and physical connections uh, with traditional transport services for intercity travel is also fundamental to encouraging a sustainable tourism experience. Next slide, please. Two examples of effective initiatives to promote sustainable transport with positive impacts on regional development include uh, Switzerland Mobility, uh, which is an extensive non-motorised transport network uh, established in 2008 for both residents and visitors uh, to Switzerland. It provides hiking, cycling, mountain biking, rollerblading and canoeing routes, um, improved perception of Switzerland as an environmentally friendly destination and access to a promising new market for tourism service providers. Secondly, uh, created in, in 2009, the New Zealand Cycle Trail consists of 22 great rides uh, covering more than 2,500 kilometres, most of which are off-road and showcasing New Zealand's unique landscape, environment, heritage and culture. And the, with the main aims of the Cycle Trail project uh, to create jobs through the design building and maintenance of, of the cycle network, which I think is very interesting. Create a high quality tourism asset that increases New Zealand's competitiveness as a tourism destination. And provide ongoing job and economic development opportunities for regional economies. All the while maximizing opportunities for events and, and a range of recreational and health benefits uh, for New Zealanders. And each year nearly, nearly 2 million people use the, the the cycle paths in New Zealand uh, and it continues to grow in popularity with over 700,000 more trips last year than in 2016, delivering many positive economic social outcomes to regional destinations. And finally, just to finish, I wanted to highlight that the focus of the International Transport Forum, uh, the, the 2021 summit to be held over the, the next couple of weeks, will focus on the importance that, that transport innovation will play in climate change and responses to COVID-19. I think this is a very timely and relevant uh, to the discussion that's taking place today, uh, with a range of innovations in sustainable mobility to be explored, which, which you can see on, on the screen here and all of which have potential applications uh, in the tourism sector as catalysts, again, for, for regional development. And thank you very much, Andre. I should say, actually, if you just go to the next slide, if you want further information on any of these, or any of these studies, there's a, a, uh, our tourism uh, page on the OECD website is available there for your information. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Peter, for giving us this international perspective. Um, on the topic that we are uh, discussing today and also for linking us to this uh, event that is coming up in the near future and the guidelines that we could definitely and should definitely take into account when talking about uh, stronger integration of uh, sustainable mobility in, in tourism uh, in the pan-European region, which will be the topic of this new the PEP Partnership on Sustainable Tourism Mobility. So thank you very much again, Peter Hexton. Um, we are now actually a bit late for the panel discussion, but anyway, um, we'll have a bit of time to discuss the questions, what is the role of the national level in promoting sustainable uh, mobility in tourism? And uh, Alexander Dörfler from the Austrian Ministry is already here on the moderation panel. Um, I would hope also to find um, Bologna, Demscha, um, sorry, the I'm, I'm really not good with, uh, uh, with Slovenian uh, names. Lona Demscha Mitrovic here on the panel. And secondly, a bit easier for me to speak, uh, Richard Kempf for, from Switzerland. So I hope these two panelists are with us. They are not. This creates a bit of a problem. They've been with us I've for seen, quite a long time. I've seen Richard. I've seen Richard, but he he's not here anymore. I thought so he's here. If, but... if you are there, Richard and uh, Bologna, please apply for the floor. I'm just uh, Richard is among the participants, so 
Okay, please just apply for sharing video and audio. Here he is. Great. Do you hear me? Yes, we see you Good and we hear you. Everybody. Good evening, Richard. Um, and what about our colleague from Slovenia? Polona, are you somewhere there? I don't uh, even see her. Andreas, we have, the, the... we have the information that she had to leave. Okay. In the chat. Okay, this is um, not good, I hope. Uh, there is nothing uh, bad that happened, why she had to leave. Anyway, we have two great people here on the panel. Uh, Sandra Dörfler from the Austrian Federal Ministry of uh, Climate Action, just short title, and uh, Richard Kemp from SWIFT, State Secretariat for Economic Affairs. He's the head of Tourism Policy Department. I hope I got that right. Perfect. Um, Thank you very much for confirming that. Um, so what, what I would be curious about uh, is how is the situation regarding the integration of sustainable mobility in tourism and vice versa at the national level in your country at the very moment? Um, and maybe start with, with uh, Richard from Switzerland. So we, we, we've seen, you've been mentioned as a good practice example with Switzerland mobile. I'm always bringing this example in, in, in presentations of good practices. But um, how do you, as an expert working in this field, see the situation at the very moment? Good, thank you, um, Andreas. Yeah, I, uh, indeed, uh, Switzerland Mobility is a best practice uh, initiative started 30 years ago as a non-motorized uh, vehicle uh, network system. And uh, originally, it wasn't for a tourist, it was for the inhabitants, just for this um, uh, um, um, mobility in the near, in the near areas. And it has really developed. Uh, nowadays, it's, it's still um, for the inhabitants, but it's also for the tourism purposes. And what is interesting, um, uh, we, we, when, you re when you look at this initiative, it takes a lot of time, 30 years. We started 30 years ago. And a second aspect, you need all partners on board. It's a public-public-private partnership model. Uh, saying this, it's, uh, the, there are different the federal uh, offices are, are part of the system. We have all the regions, all the 26 cantons are part of it. And we have the private sector also within this network. Um, this is really crucial. We, we, you can't develop the mobility systems and the sustainable mobility systems without, without establishing a, a network approach. And the uh, third aspect is, is uh, what is really important is to find um, sustainable uh, financing solutions. Mm -hmm. um, originally, um, in the past, the, the public, public transport system was 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 and is financed on an ongoing, not limited uh, um, uh, basis. But uh, if you look at the more um, tourist touristic uh, uh, aspects of this mobility system, there we have this project financing approach. We we we, we support for two or three or four years initiatives to. Uh, like to like a, like a startup uh, um, um, and this doesn't really work in the, in the in the field of the mobility because you have this um, this um, ongoing costs um, and you have to find really good solutions with this uh, with this mobility aspect um, integrating the tourism partners and uh, this is what more Switzerland mobility has brought the success is this. Uh, also thinking in uh, on in the on the long long term perspective, how do we finance this these solutions? And what's really interesting is nowadays uh, the, the 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 mobility in Switzerland is not only seen as a car going from A to B, but we really have um, have some sort of experience oriented the mobility system with all this uh, this, uh, this 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 train routes uh, through Switzerland, but also the, the bike tours, the, the, the cycling tours, they're, they're more and more seen as an experience 
uh, ex themselves. And this is, I think, is the is the key for the for for bringing the tourism sector on board. If they realize, okay, this can be a tourism product, then mm -hmm. they join they join the, the transport um, system and. It was very well shown with the Danube um, uh, example how, of how this can work. And this is the way to go. And perhaps the last point, what is very important, uh, you talked, uh, you talk about, uh, or you mentioned the, the role of the state. If we, if we um, look, if we uh, speak only about, about the, the, the top routes or the top products like Danube, then it can be possible that the private sector can arrange it. But this is not the way to go. You have also to think about the rural remote areas where you don't have the, the, the traffic, the enough traffic on the routes to, to commercialize it really. I think this is really challenging. If you want to have a network, a sophisticated network with routes and products, then you need the, the that the, the, the state on the on the on the regional on the national level uh, uh, as partner within it. Otherwise, you don't, you just have uh, two or three top products uh, financing them on their own, and this cannot be the future. Especially not if you're talking about sustainability in, in the in the mobility um, topic. I think that's a very crucial point, and I also think the Danube has this kind of top product. So when looking at Germany, Austria, also partly at Hungary, but there are a lot of areas, especially in the lower parts of the Danube, where we need a lot of intervention and support from the region, from the national level, in order to create this kind of products there and to increase the traffic, to bring more people there and to let them benefit from the sustainable benefits, or sustainable impact of, of tourism in their regions. Um, I'd like to switch to, to Sandra. Um, we've now heard how Switzerland is dealing with that. Um, the sustainable support on, on, also on financial terms, uh, that is very important. Um, I think in Austria, we do have certain instruments in place that are already working quite well in terms of bringing people together and financing. But I think there's also some um, steps to be taken for a uh, broader application of uh, these instruments, of this concept of sustainable mobility and tourism. Am I right? Yes, kind of. Uh, in, in terms of bringing people together, uh, we, we have been working with the Ministry of Agriculture, Regions uh, and Tourism. Um, we, the Ministry for Climate Action, we have been working together for quite a couple of years. Uh, we, we have started a platform tourism mobility with uh, with the various stakeholders from the from the national level and from the um, regional level from the tourism industry from the tourism sector and also from the mobility sector uh, we have started I think it was in 2013 so quite a couple of year years ago uh, it's a platform it's a kind of knowledge uh, exchange platform where we meet twice a year. Uh, we talk about uh, we have a, we have an agenda and uh, talk about the initiatives that are going on in our country about webinars that have been organized uh, new projects like also the the, the 360 degrees project from the uh, railway uh, company from the Austrian railway companies and uh, we also organize a tourism mobility day um, once a year we uh, have been starting organizing this, I think it was in, in 2014. And there we bring all the, the players from the industry, from the private sector and the public sector together. We change uh, the place every year. And we, we have one special topic. Uh, we have panels and we also have time for discussions, time for networking. Uh, maybe they're find the, 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 the people can find uh, themselves, the regions can cooperate and find new um, partners. Uh, we have um, different um, topics like uh, sustainable mobility at big events, uh, communication, cooperation. Uh, last year we had, um, I don't know uh, how to say, it's like um, uh, experience from tra transnational uh, projects, sustainability projects, uh, and it's always a nice uh, happening. Last year we had it online. Hopefully this uh, fall we will have it uh, live again. 
uh, and it's always a good uh, thing for for uh, getting to know what's going on in the sustainable tourism mobility um, uh, field in in the country. We have the funding program from our ministry, from the Ministry for Climate Protection. Um, we have support, we have a funding program and also a consulting program. Where we, uh, you know, with the with the consulting program, we offer free of charge uh, services uh, for for businesses and also for destinations. And in this um, in this um, consulting program, we also inform about the funding possibility. And of course, I think I've forgotten one thing: is uh, we have we have uh, produced a guideline together with the Ministry for Agriculture and Tourism. For, for destinations, so uh, the guidelines should help the destinations uh, how to become sustainable mobile. Wow. It's unfortunate it's only in, in German, but I can provide uh, here the, the uh, listeners with the link. Maybe, maybe it's, uh, this guideline could be also one of the products of a possible partnership uh, uh, in the frame of, framework of the PEP. Uh -huh. Supporting destinations in taking the next steps of becoming more sustainable. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm very sorry that we don't have our Slovenian colleague with us, um, but she wanted, uh, I think, to share with us the experience of Slovenia. Actually, we were trying to find somebody in Slovenia who is responsible uh, on the national level for this topic of sustainable mobility in tourism. Uh, people that we found in Switzerland, people that we found in Austria, and that we also find in some other countries. But in Slovenia, we were not very successful. But Polona actually agreed that she will speak about this topic because uh, she, as a representative of the Ministry of Infrastructure, feels responsible for it. But anyway, there is still this way, this, this step to be taken that Austria already took, and definitely Switzerland did, in bringing together the relevant uh, institutions on the national level coordinating activities and supporting uh, also other uh, stakeholders from the transport and the tourism uh, sector to to uh, to uh, bring forward this concept of sustainable mobility and tourism um, I, I like this very much this this, this long-term perspective that Richard uh, you mentioned um, what we would like to offer with this the partnership on, on on sustainable tourism mobility is a platform to exchange uh, about ideas, initiatives, good practices that are already in place. A platform that should bring together different stakeholders that are necessary to um, bring forward these initiatives also on a transnational level. There are a lot of initiatives that have to be coordinated there. Uh, we've got this information from, uh, from Austrian Federal Railways. When they are uh, actually opening up a new branch of uh, or a new destination for the night jet, they need to have people on the other side. Uh, Ed Lancaster talk, told us about uh, the Eurobler network. You need a lot of uh, stakeholders to be involved and coordination done on the transnational level. For me, the big question now would be how can we actually convince more countries to jump on this train, more countries to uh, integratively think about this topic and not just think but set steps to promote it to support the relevant stakeholders how do you think we could uh, convince more countries to jump on this train i i'm um, i'm not really um, uh, capable of answer answering the question because i don't uh, know exactly about the program, but um, I have uh, had some uh, um, first discussions with my colleagues from the from the Federal Office for Transport, and uh, it seems that Switzerland is quite interested in, um, uh, to participate here, and I think it's absolutely crucial for me because you can't you can't uh, find really sustainable solutions for the mobility in tourism without thinking internationally and, and even globally um, the most the most critical aspect um, regarding sustainability in uh, in tourism uh, in the mobility field is the long haul travel uh, coming our guests from 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 asia or from the from the americas Flying, coming here with their fly, with their flights, and then 
when they are in Switzerland, we offer them uh, a sustainable mobility concept. This is some 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 in some way a bit weird. Or if you talk about Europe, uh, you in within Europe, you should um, we, ha we should have an integrated system uh, like it was shown has been shown with this night train example. We have to go back uh, 30 years ago how, how it how the system was then uh, really with integrate with an integrated train system um, with um, also with the electrification of the of the of the of the vehicles we need to do this on an international basis and I'm very happy to to, to have get um, to have got uh, some in, in insights now into this PEP initiative and I think. Um, this is absolutely the way to go. Uh, how to convince the countries? Um, it's it's a, it's a mega trend. It's the future for our for us and for our planet. Uh, and I think uh, we have to. Um, and at the end, I'm, I'm I'm convinced that it's also the best way for the for the economy for the businesses to 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 go this way, because um, it it will be uh, it will be the the standard in 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 some years um, we will be. Um, Will be standards to have a sustainable way of, of traveling around of and uh, it's just to 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 push this this process and um, we have to do it together i think thank you very much for this very motivating words i think there's a lot of arguments for countries to join this new the PAN partnership on sustainable tourism mobility uh, i would be very happy to see switzerland participating <laughs> um, I will do my best. No, really, this is. Uh, I, I think this is the future for us, of course, and we can learn from each other. I've learned a lot uh, only in this session now. Uh, good examples, sharing good examples, um, you know, give insights of how it how how it works and where can be the challenges. Um, we have to do it like this. And this will be actually the, the main objective of this new partnership: uh, sharing information, sharing ideas, initiatives getting to know each other, getting to know the challenges that we are actually facing together, but maybe on different levels, and trying to, to cope with these uh, challenges uh, together, um, that will bring us definitely a step forward. So thank you very much for everybody here. Um, I think um, we are, it, it's obvious that we are inviting all countries interested to join this new partnership. The partnership will be launched along with a high level meeting uh, next week, next uh, Monday, Tuesday. Um, so after that, you will receive information how it will work. It will very will work on a very low scale. So there is there is no obligations. It's just being active and network and come together and participate in meetings. And speaking about meetings, we are planning the first meeting of the PEP partnership on uh, sustainable tourism mobility in October. So everybody who is sending me uh, information that he or she is interested uh, will receive this invitation. We'll also use other circles to, to raise the awareness for this uh, event and for this opportunity. Um, so please uh, get in touch with us and use this opportunity to jump on this train, on the sustainable train to the future. Um, again, thanks a lot for our panelists, Richard, Alexandra, uh, for our speakers who've provided great inputs and insights in their daily business. It's great that so many people are actually dealing with this topic on a daily basis. This is also one of the findings, I think, from today's meeting. Uh, thanks uh, very much, Ingrid, for supporting us here today. Uh, thanks also, Monica Klinger, uh, for providing all the, the, the connections to people uh, in this area. Uh, thanks to the two ministries supporting the webinar and the partnership. And I hope to see a lot of uh, national authorities, motivated people uh, joining in for the first meeting of the PEP partnership on sustainable tourism mobility. This is it from my side. Thanks a lot. Um, you will be able to um, have a look at this webinar again or share it. It's been recorded. So you will receive all the information about that if there is anything uh, you want to get back to. Thanks a lot and all the best from Vienna. Bye bye. Thanks, you. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye.